Welcome to the Explosive Swing Podcast with Jared Pitney. In this episode, I'm going to go over some questions that I've received through Instagram and email. And I've got some notes here that stuff I just want to go over and things I just want to share with everybody. And uh, also talk about the next episode. The next episode I'll probably do tomorrow. I'm going to cover BS speed training like ladders, sand, and force production, tight end physics, and go over my hardcore notes or my concrete notes that I have here so that we can kind of start to reveal what is the real truth instead of all that fake stuff. And I'm gonna go over how my logo, the meaning behind the Explosive Mechanics logo, why the barbell in between Explosive and Mechanics. So anyway, let's get on with today. The first question comes from Ben at B3 Human Performance. And I don't know who Ben's talking to here. Uh, he just sent me a screenshot of it. It has his logo, but he sent me a text message and asked me this. He said, what's your opinion? And I was gonna call him and didn't get a chance. Time schedules did not work out. Anyway, hopefully he hears this. And if he's got any other questions, give me a call, send me a text, send me an email. I do, do not do a very good job with the email. Some of these emails I'm gonna to read today is probably from January. <laughs> Great job, Jared. Uh, Jared's not very organized. So anyway, I don't know who Ben's talking to with this and I'm, he wanted me to give my opinion. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I know a lot of people use it, but I lose the soft top. And they're ta we're talking about the, I use when we squat our athletes here, we use a 12 inch box, steel frame box with a six inch blue soft top foam pad. They do make a black one, which is more of a hard top, which is still six inches. With a blue pad, you actually sit in and it's harder to get out of, uh, but this guy, we'll get into that. I use, like, a, I'm not building powerlifters. I do take kids to powerlifting meets, but I'm not building power, I'm building athletes. Everything I do is for athletic performance. And so some people may want to be building a squat just to be building a squat, but like you've heard me say before, and I'm gonna bring out the notes on the next podcast, when I have these athletes box squat, their 40-yard dashes change every month. When I move them away from the box squat, their squat, their speed does not change. So, you know, I had a little kid. Um, he's short, I don't have him squatting with the blue foam pad. I have him squatting all the way down to just the box itself. I did not have him box squat. I've been working on a squat form. I took him to the safety squat bar. I took him to front squats. I took him to regular squats. Three months, no change in speed, put him to the box, boom, two months in a row, got a tenth and got another tenth. And what these athletes I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a tenth of a second off their 40 yard dash per month. So that's why I use the box. I'm not building, like I don't know what this guy's doing. I'm not building athletes to come in here and have a better, say, Squat for, well, I do care about their squat at school because I will have some, it depends on the situation. Everything works and it just depends on what I'm trying to do for that particular kid. If I do regular, like um, like little Alex, some of my youth athletes, we will regular squat. I'm not really concerned about their running speed. I'm concerned about building a base, teaching them how to squat so that when we do box squat, that they know how to box squat. And like this guy says, they crash on a box. Yeah, kids will have a tendency to crash on a box, even if a kid's not perfect. You know, I, I told someone the other day, People spend so much freaking time worried about technique and not enough damn time worried about getting stronger. If you, oh, one little thing goes wrong, one little thing goes wrong, kids are resilient. You can pound a kid and they have their adaptation rate, their ability to recover is so freaking high, it's not even funny. Like little Alex, 10-year-old uh, Alex weighing 67 pounds, squatted 136 pounds, which is which was 62.0 uh, kilograms. That's double body weight, 2.02 .02 times her body weight. All right, our form's not perfect, but if I worried about being perfect all the time, like I had a guy that's from the Army, he was in here the other day, he was like, damn. He said, how far do you let him go? I know, I said, just what I see and what I feel, you know, everything's, that's why if I'm not here, the gym shut down. I don't have people working for me because I need to know what's going on with all these kids and not putting in someone else's hands because a lot of people don't think like I do. And so I like to push and I like to push the envelope. And that's probably why Louis sent Michael Fahey of Westside Film down 
to uh, talk to me about the West Side versus the World documentary. And if you've not checked out West Side versus the World, you need to watch it. And you need to, if you have a gym, you need to put it in your gym and put it on repeat. Uh, great movie, great job, Michael. So I've done a podcast with him. If you want to go back and check that out, that's fine too. But anyway, I have no clue what rabbit hole I just went down. Let's just talk about this. I just wanted to let you know why. When I, when I talk about stuff, it's because I am after athletic human performance, running speed, vertical jump height, and general overall strength. But when we do a box squat, it is for explosive strength. We are trying to increase our strength speed with the box squat. It is a method of squatting. It's not squatting. You gotta get the freaking squat out of your head. Um, it's a method of squatting. Why do the hell we squat? We, the only reason we damn squat is to run faster. And I just found out one of my competitors around here in this local Peachtree City area, guess what? They haven't even had their freaking people squat, so how in the hell are they gonna get faster? Uh, power cleans? Uh, BS. We're gonna talk about that crap hopefully on the next episode. Power cleans do not make you faster. If you look at all the Olympic lifting crap, the Olymp why do you think the Olympic lifters can freaking jump? Why do you think they're so freaking explosive? Well, they front squat, they back squat, and they clean. And a clean is when you pull the bar off the ground, extend, and get under it. Uh, power clean is just pulling the weight from off the ground to the standing upright position with no squat under. So the difference between a power clean and a clean is a squat under. So squat under is a clean. A power clean is when they do not squat under. And sometimes these high school coaches are teaching these kids to clean, to squat under. Well, if you if you look at their technique, they're not extending their hips. They'll pop the bar, boom, drop up. There's no knee, and there's no hip extension, and there's no improvement in their vertical jumps. So if you're doing a power clean and you have no improvement in your vertical jump, the freak are you doing it for? Increasing power. Don't squat under. Power clean, power clean. Don't clean. You know, there's a big difference, and I don't even know if people even know the difference. Um, so, I'm gonna get off on that freaking rant. The, the Olympic lifters can jump and move because their legs are so freaking strong. Usually, 75% of whatever they front squat is what they're gonna clean. Well, if they don't have any damn legs to, to squat, they sure as hell ain't gonna clean. They clean, uh, squat 100 pounds, front squat 100 pounds, clean is going to be 75 pounds so you have to drive the legs up so if, if you're telling these people well i don't hardly squat my people that right there tells me that they're not getting faster they're not jumping higher. they're doing a clean because it's freaking pushed down our damn throat so much that you think you have to do it a lot of nfl teams and a lot of colleges are getting away from the stupid power clean we don't do any of the power cleans here i have nothing against them it just don't work fast enough for me you know, all these kids don't have perfect technique. So you, you'll spend months working on technique with a freaking broomstick. Damn, if you got a, again, that damn technique thing, working on technique with a broomstick, um, PVC pipe, or whatever you're doing, you're working and spending so much time trying to get the body in these positions when there's other ways to do the damn job. You know, 20 plus athletes out of here have jumped 40 inch vertical. I'm gonna create a plaque and put that on the wall so that when people come here, they'll see how many people have jumped 40 inch verticals. What is jumping? Jumping is explosive power. What are we? We are explosive mechanics. And without the freaking leg strength, we're not getting off the ground. You know, so we box squat for power. And I'm gonna explain the difference between the hard top and the soft top as soon as I freaking get off my damn rants here. So let's just get on with this. All right. I'll start all over. I know a lot of people use it, but I'd lose the soft top. It dense force production by absorbing force, just like sand. And I'm gonna go over that sand BS on the next episode because that's horseshit. Um, therefore, when we sit, we are not building the holding time of force production that's critical to the box squat. And here's the big one, it's dangerous. Uh, kids feel like, feel the box and think they're home and they'll plop on the box, risking back injury, being hurt from front to back, which is dangerous. Um, and it could also lead to a fracture or breakage of the vertebrae wing, which could lead uh, to paralysis. Not worth it on any front. Well, 
plop. Yet yeah, sometimes the kids will plop down, but the weight's not heavy enough to hurt them. And you teach them. That's why I'll take these little girls like Alex and I'll take some of these other kids and I'll build their regular squat first if they're real young. If they go to high school and squat, I don't have to worry about it. You know, it's, we go through phases here. Like sometimes I don't worry, like I may have already said, I don't worry about improving a kid's running speed, especially if they're youth, per month all the time. I'll take care of their structure. We'll do regular squats. We'll do safety bar squats. We'll do pause squats. We will do a varying amount of different squats. And I don't change it all the time. Like if you've listened to me before, use it long enough to get a benefit out of it, then switch. So you can't just, you gotta take the situation in your own hands. That's why I run everything by myself. Cause I like to look, I like to know, I like to experiment. And so, whatever. Not worth it on any front. Well, this kid, whoever Ben's talking to, is obviously not even testing him. Um, he said it also gives a little help off the box, which is the most critical piece of the hamstring work coming off the box. I've done a lot of work on two soft tops and found that after a month, all my athletes were weaker with it. I've done a lot of month work with it, but I've only done it for a month. Uh, I don't think that's a lot of work, Hammer. So, does it give help? No. Sit on a hard chair, stand up. All right, go sit on your couch cushion, sink in and try to stand up. It's a little harder, okay? The, the biggest difference between the soft top and the hard top is the hard top box will use more hips and more hamstrings. Hard top, hips, hamstrings, all right? Hips, hamstrings, everything starts with H. Hips, hamstrings, and hard top. Now the soft top is more leg drive, all right? So what am I concerned? I'm concerned with my box squat transferring over to my 40 yard dash. By box squatting, and if you go back and listen to the box squat episodes, you'll understand that the, by box squatting, it's a method. It's not the all end all, be all, to whatever somebody else is thinking. And remember, I'm testing 40s. People come here to get faster. I'm gonna to prove to you that you can get faster if you do what I say. Um, it breaks up the eccentric concentric chain. All right, static dynamic method, breaking up the eccentric concentric chain, still overcome by dynamic action. So you sit on the box, and you apply compensatory acceleration to stand up with the bar as fast as you can. We'll put a tendo on the bar. Like this kid in here, he was squatting the other day. And I just hooked a tendo up to him and just wanted to see what squat speeds he was moving at. He went from a 0.44 to a 0.66 in one day with the same damn weight. Because he didn't understand how to accelerate the bar until he read the number. The Tendo unit, if anything else, it's the immediate feedback to what they're doing. Because you may tell the kid that they're moving it fast. They don't know what fast is until they see fast. So, and they said, Jared, why do you, why do they do that when you come over? Because I don't know why. The kids usually will perform a little bit better when I come over there and pay attention to them. You can see sometimes where they're kind of getting stuck in the middle. They have to learn, compensatory acceleration is accelerating the bar at maximum velocity speeds. Um, it can be with anything. Um, the kid didn't know what speed was. So once he found what a 6'6 felt like, he knew how to go for it. And said he was just, he would just been over there squatting at 0.44, which would not have as much of a change. So we're going down to the box, stopping, letting the energy dissipate and boom, exploding up. We don't, we don't touch and go real fast. It's a sit, boom, explode. Work on exploding, work on accelerating the bar. Um, and we'll talk about the physics of power is strength and time because our distance is constant. So we'll talk about that maybe in the next couple episodes. Uh, so we're using the box squat with soft pad for ultimate leg drive because Getting out on our 40 yard dash is the most critical part. And I hate it when people say, I need to work on my start. I need to work on my start. I need to work on my start. It freaking gets on my freaking nerves. 
I have seen kids run a 155 and a 154 complete laser time and still be slower. This is a 10 yard dash, a 155 and a 154 in the 10 yard dash and still run a slower 40 than the kids who run a 161 10 yard dash. The most predictor of what the 40 yard dash is gonna be would be the 20 yard. I've seen some kids, depending on how they're setting their steps up, they'll run a 10 yard dash and they'll get a better 10 yard time, but the 10 to 20 time drops for some reason. I'm still trying to figure all this stuff out. But when they have a crappier 10 yard dash, their 20 yard dash, their zero to 10 is crappier, but their 10 to 20 is better with a lower 20 yard dash time. And I don't know why that is. And sometimes if you get them with um, a great 10 yard, some reason their 10 to 20 is crappy, which some reason results in overall lower, I mean a worse 20 yard dash. So the 20 yard dash, I've been trying to tell these kids is the most critical part. You know, they want to work on the start. Well, how do you work on your start? You have to overcome inertia. What do you need? You need greater leg drive. You don't need the hips and the hamstrings just it hips and hamstrings is past the 20 yard dash point so in order to get a greater 40 yard dash you're gonna have you can't run a good 40 with a crappy 20 or I hate to say it but even 10 i don't really care for the 10 yard dash um so what do we need we need leg drive where do we get the leg drive from we're getting it from the freaking soft top that's why we don't use a hard top greater leg drive what do we need we need greater leg drive when we jump so we need leg drive and a lot of stuff we do. And if we want hips and hamstrings, instead of squatting down to the hard box, we'll deadlift. Deadlift is hip extension. Working your lower back and your hamstrings as they cross the hip. Also, we'll do um, some type of leg curls. We'll do Nordics. We'll do uh, the inverse curl. We'll do some type of hamstring at the hip. We'll do some type of hamstring at the knee. Or sometimes we'll have some direct lower back work where we do the 45 hyper. So hopefully I can answer all that question with that. So there's other ways to prepare your recipe or whatever it is that you're trying to do. And so if that guy has done a lot of work with it in one month, he has, knows absolutely nothing. And so I don't like, it depends. I don't even know what that guy's doing. I'm, ben was talking, Ben again at uh, B3 Human Performance sent me this. And I don't know who he was talking to, and I don't know what, so that, therefore, I don't know what the guy is implementing for. Is he training power lifters? Is he just training people to squat? You know, we're using the box squat because it's a method, again, I'm gonna pound that in everybody's head. It's a method of squatting. What do we use that method of squatting for? Do I care about, I do care about how strong the people are, but they're not going to competition. So I don't care about their regular squat, you know? unless I do take him to a powerlifting competition. And I did take a kid to a powerlifting competition and I box squatted him the whole damn time up until that competition. And guess what? Kid squatted 661 at 17 years old. Box squatted the whole damn time. And there are some other kids that will have to regular squat. But if this guy is concerned, okay, I've done a lot of work on soft tops, found out after a month, a lot of work after a month. That's not a lot of work. You can't really get that much chunk change in a month the athletes were weaker with it. They may be weaker with the regular squat. Who gives a crap? The regular squat's not the one making them faster. So you gotta quit putting stuff into people's heads. That's wrong. If you care about their running speed, test it. Test it every freaking month. And if you wanna get faster, freaking squat and increase your box squat and increase your rate of force development. So anyway, Ben, hopefully I cover that for what you wanted. Um, this next one comes from Ronnie. Uh, hey, Jared, I've been following your podcast for a while now. I'm currently a football slash strength coach at a small high school in Louisiana. I have implemented the methods from the Conjugate View book by Nate Harvey. One thing I've learned from your podcast is to squat more than once per week. So I've been squatting twice a week and once every three weeks, that we do speed squats with bands. I have a few questions about how you vary your volume and intensity in the same week. We currently do one week of 
five plus at 85% top set, plus three at 90% top set second week, and plus one at 90% top set last week. The fourth week, we repeat the process adding five pounds. We always do some type of jump before we squat. How would you adjust what we are doing now? We only have 15 minutes a day to work out four days a week. I'm just trying to learn anything I can. Any help is greatly appreciated. Thank you for the amazing podcast, Ronnie. Thanks for the words. Thanks for the email. How would I adjust that? It sounds like you're giving all the kids the same thing to do. Here at Explosive Mechanics, I don't know if you have time, and I know somebody, sometimes when you're dealing with the high school population, sometimes you may be dealing with kids that want to be there and kids that do not want to be there. So, uh, I don't, I don't know about that. It's, it's harder. I think it'd be harder there. I think it'd be harder because of the kids, you've got some interested, you got some that don't want to be there. But in another aspect, I think it'd be easier because you know they're always there. Here, I don't know if the kid's always going to be here uh, consistently per per week, two days a week, or whatever. They may say they're coming here three days a week. May show up twice. Next week, they may show up three. Next week, who knows? They may not even show up but once. So that's the thing about colleges and high schools. At least you have them there. But what I would do differently is I would... I don't know how to do anything else other than what I know how to do, which is I give all my athletes here that come in here individualized folders. Everybody's sets and reps are for them. When I train my teams, like the lacrosse team, um, everything is still individually written per individual girl based off of their last couple of workouts. So our folders that I give them cover 12 workouts, and I can look back at certain I can look back at, so if the day is workout four, I can look back at three, two, and one to see how the pro, the progress is. We do not do, I will start them off on a, basically a hardcore like percentage, but then I don't wave or we don't go from 80 to 85 to 90 strictly because sometimes the kids adaptation rate, everybody's different. And so if I treated them all the same, Sometimes if I, like if I were to go off and print off a six week program off the internet, all the kids, there will be some kids that that's too much volume or that's too much workload or whatever you want to call it, that's too much for that one kid. For kid two, it may, that may be written perfectly for him at his adaptation rate for that stimulus. And person three, it may not be enough, that person may need more. So if, if, if everybody's always given the same thing as far as like if you go for, out for a workout or like a, a CrossFit, you know, um, CrossFit people don't care about beating numbers. They just care about getting in shape. So they'll put a workout of the day on the board and it's hard to get through the workout, but that does not mean the workout was efficient at producing a desired result. So nothing on CrossFit, if people want to go CrossFit, go CrossFit, but don't don't compare CrossFit to me or anything else I do. I hate it. Hey, is it like CrossFit? Freaking no. Uh, CrossFit don't care about performance numbers like that. Um, they just care about getting in shape. So, won't get off on too much of that. So anyway, I, I would start by individualizing the kids' workouts. I mean, manipulating their steps. Sometimes these kids are volume responders. Sometimes they're intensity responders. In particular for their bench press, a lot of the kids can uh, respond pretty well to intensity with their squat. I don't volumize the squat. We don't hardly, we never really do anything over five reps. Usually, some kids are sets of two, sets of three, sets of four, sets of five, somewhere around there, and I wave the weights around. So instead of sticking to like an 85% at the top set, that's at five reps at 85% at the top set. Five reps at a true 85% is gonna be a bitch to get. Um, but I would not, well, it would not be a bitch to get if you worked up to it and ended there at that five plus. I would start them off maybe three sets at 85% and see three sets of four or somewhere around there. And maybe if you do a fourth set or fifth set, 
see how many they're gonna get with it. If you do three sets of four at 85%, then you try it on your fourth set. You do four, 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 and on your fourth set, you try to get as many as you get. Guarantee you a lot of kids are not gonna get more than five reps. Um, they may end up with fours or threes, fives, fours, and threes on their last set. Just depends on, it depends on the rest break. And being you got 50 minutes, you can't rest as long as I can here because once a kid gets here, we may start on the hour, but they're not necessarily let out on that hour. Uh, we're, we don't work like, Jared, what time? I don't pay attention to the clock. I'm in here to train. Um, Sometimes we don't ever start on time. You know, if, if my six o'clock group, we may start 6.05, 6.03, 6.07, somewhere in that range. Um, and I'll still have people from the five o'clock left over trying to finish up what they're doing. I don't care how long they're here. They're gonna, we're gonna, I try to start them at the top of the hour, not specifically at six zero zero o'clock at night or whatever time the group's training. The five o'clock hour may be, uh, I've got some kids that are here from four. They may still here be here at six because we got to work on a lot of different things. I'm not running a cookie cutter program. I'm not getting you in and out like these other places around me. And then I don't think people understand it. But you know, it's also boring to watch training. You know, if I've got your kid resting five minutes between sets, you're like wondering what the hell they're doing playing on their damn phone um, or sitting there. You know, we're resting, we have to. You know, and, and sometimes the younger, the weaker, younger kids, we don't have to rest that long. But the older kids, once they realize, oh shit, it's not like high school, we can actually rest longer, they're actually seeing their reps get better. They're seeing their strength progress at a faster rate. It's because I can control that a lot better here. I'm not running a damn boot camp to where it's like high school or college where they're trying to get them in and out, trying to condition them with the weight room. No, the weight room's performance. You can take your ass out to the freaking field, condition them, or whatever else you want to do for the conditioning. Um, so we don't, I would, I would do more reps at 85% or more sets at 85%. I would do more. I wouldn't do one top set at 90%. And I, roughly, we don't get to 95 until after about, it depends on the kids. You know, sometimes I, like I had this uh, kid, and you may have heard me talk in the last podcast, came in with 250 bench max. Then he did 285 for sets of three the other day. So we went from 250 max to 275 max. Now he's repping 285 for threes very quickly and this is all since january so we're only at the beginning of um march within three within almost not even three full months two and a half you could say strength has gone up very rapid um, and that's what i do i increase strength at rapid rates of speed and not only that we get faster so i would add more sets at those percentages and maybe go all out. It looks like it could be a five. I don't know if you're Ronnie. I don't know if you're using a five, three, one method. I don't know. Um, I would, I would do more sets at those percentages, not one at that top set. You could do two or three sets at that weight and then do it all out on your last one. If you wanted to, um, I do like the fact that you jump before you squat. I don't know how much time y'all spend jumping. Uh, once I told my high school guys in here the other day that we was gonna, um, I was gonna put a plaque on the wall for people who've achieved a 40 plus inch vertical here. Shit, they spent an hour jumping. Then they worked, they went from four to five jumping. Then at five o'clock they did the workout. You don't have that time. Um, so just trying to learn anything you can, greatly appreciate it. Um, if you have any more questions on it, I would just add more sets at that percentage, Ronnie. If, if that's what you would want to do. Um, I allow the kids to warm up. Sometimes the high school around here don't allow them to warm up. I'll allow them. I'll get in there after they jump. So if it's gonna go on our lower body day, come in, jump. Maybe spend the first 15 minutes jumping. After jumping, give them 10 minutes to warm up. Jeez, uh, we're already at 20 minutes. If you 15 minutes jumping, 25 minutes for warm up for squat, or if they can warm, warm up within five minutes, then sometimes here I give my kids four to five minutes in between their squat sets. You're almost out of time. So that 50 minutes is cut tight. Um, some jumping is better than no jumping. The most critical thing would be to squat. If you're squat, you have to increase your squat and your rate of force production. Um, work on compensatory acceleration. Or work on trying to accelerate the bar all the way out. Um, I don't know, I'd have to talk to you a little bit more. 
So Ronnie, if you have any questions, uh, you can email me again and I'll try to get that hammered out for you. Um, so hopefully this helps you out, but I would, I would jump, squat, and work on some accessories, you know. If you really just want your athletes to get faster, you only really gotta do three things. Jump, squat, sprint. Um, and if you've heard me talk about before, the tread sled, we do a 15 second all out sprint. And a lot of kids hate it on that tread sled. They don't wanna do it, they'll skip it. But when they do do it, and I showed some kids the other day, I, I tracked a girl, every time her, tread, her um, tread sled went up three yards, she decreased her 40 time by a 10th of a second without much jumping. So we was just squatting and sprinting at that point. Uh, but sometimes their jump don't go up. So jump, sprint, squat, 15 second all out sprint. We'll alter uh, fibers. You know, you'll have an increase in fast switch percentage fibers and a decrease in slow twitch percentage fibers helping out with the speed and explosiveness. So anyway, Ronnie, I hope that helps. Uh, this next one comes from Jeff Smith, uh, dumbbell jumps. Hey coach, uh, first off, I'm a big fan of the podcast. I have two questions about dumbbell jumps. Is the dumbbell weight being based on a percentage of the squat max? No. What rep range are you recommending? Um, Jeff, is it rep range for my dumbbell jumps or is it rep range for my squats? I'm just going to assume that it's rep range for my dumbbell jumps. We do not sit on the mat and do multiple jumps. We do not jump, 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 jump. It's one, set the damn weights down, let the next person know. One, set the weights down. So if you got four, you can rotate four. If you got jump mats, I don't know how you're rotating. So three, four people in a group and jump max effort. Everything's max, it's a dynamic effort, but it's moved at maximum effort speed. So we're just not hopping. I like told a kid the other day, he was here near freaking hopping. He went damn jumping, he was hopping. Try to go down, impulses change in momentum down boom try to change the direction with the weight in your hand as fast as you can go straight up extend the body i don't like it when these kids feet fly forward when they're jump although i'm trying to break some of them their habit they may get a better jump number on the jump mat when their feet fly forward but their jump will not continue to improve because jumping ability is hip extension um, what extends the hip your glutes and your hamstrings uh, what extends the knee your quads so if you can work on that, so when you squat your knees and hips and all that extend at the same time, and if you can try to visualize that when you squat, we're in about the, <clears throat> out of the bottom, uh, you'll be a lot more explosive. Um, rep range, I don't know. Sometimes I'll have the athletes here, being I've got a lot of time. I'm not constrained to a certain amount of time. The kids here, I've got a little group of softball girls. They may be here an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, We'll try to beat some type of run. We'll maybe beat our tread sled. We may do beat some type of sprint. We may I'll try to get them to beat their dumbbell jumps. Rep range. Not I don't really have. I used to I used to write down five sets of three with dumbbell jumps. Three with the weight. I meant two with two jumps with the weight, one without. That's one set. But I turn around and Jared, we're done. I and I look at the clock, it's not even been five minutes, how in the hell are you doing? Well, it only says five sets. So when I started writing down on their, on their folders, specific sets and reps, they just rushed through it and didn't put any effort behind it. And so I said, screw that. So then I didn't even write anything down at all. And so then they said, well, Jared didn't write anything, so I didn't do anything. So you have to learn how, look, we have to jump and we have to be at a number. If you do not have a jump mat or any way to test their vertical jump, jumping with the weights, they may not have that visual feedback in order to learn how to push themselves. You know, there's a thing called training age. You got to learn how to demand that crap out of your body. And so without the tendo, without a tread sled, I've got stuff here that measures and gives you feedback when you're done so that you can see what you're doing. And it's a, like this kid, his vertical jump's already going up, I think he said five inches and in about six weeks. That's because he cares to beat his numbers. If you don't have a device or something to measure your jump height with, the kids are not gonna care because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing it for. There's no way to 
measure if they're getting better or not. Um, so rep range, 10 sets of one maybe, max. Depends on how much time you people have. Um, I'd recommend minimum eight sets of one, I think. Um, eight to 10 sets of one, I think would be good. Um, if I ever get off my butt and get that book, that book out, I'll show you, I'll talk about exactly how we do everything. When to change, how to change, what weights I recommend for different age. And it's all recommendations. And I like these dumbbell jump questions. I like, these questions, when you people ask me about this jump stuff, it really helps me to kind of lay out in my brain how I want this book or this manual or whatever I'm going to create to look so that they can answer your questions. So I don't feel scared to send me some questions because I told someone the other day I have a hard, I like the podcast because I can talk and just kind of ramble on about what's in my brain and how it works. But my thought process moves too damn quick for me to, if I'm starting to type here, I'm like, shit, what the hell? I just lost my damn thought process. How do I get my brain to my paper or to my computer even? And so I promise I'll work on that. And once I do, and if you have the tools, I guarantee you your vertical jumps will go out the world, you know, because I spend a lot of time studying this. And, and, and I get messages all the time from people um, wondering what we do and it's gonna be my thing to do so that I can share with people that's what I want to do I want to share but I I spend so much time doing it and understand it I, I just can't give everything away for free you know so anyway 10 sets of one with that is probably what I would do okay this guy this comes from Andy Davis hey Jared just want to say or let you know that we tested 40s last week and my boys were down one tenth and 1.8 tenths respectively. We've been using the 5% rule on box squatting two to three times per week since our phone call late January. Um, two quick questions. Can I buy a couple of Explosive Mechanics hoodies? Andy, you sure can, you did. I shipped them. So hopefully you get those and um, wear them proudly. I will explain what the logo means and hopefully that people will want more of the Explosive Mechanics logo, the physics, the meaning, and the science behind the logo. And the podcast episode 39 and the Zach Lasky episode, you talk about going from 315 to 405 at 0.6 meters per second. Is that for sets and reps or a one rep max? My older kid currently at 305 for three sets of three with most reps being at 0.6 meters per second. He's a junior in high school, and we're trying to have him get to a sub 540 yard dash before summer football camp starts. He currently is at a 535 at 237 body weight. <sighs> 237, yeah, he's going to have to get that up. Um, when, like when he was doing last game, when a lot of these other kids, um, I don't know what uh, uh, this kid I got Zach Quick in here the other day. I don't know what I had him doing. Um, I've got so many people doing so many different things at one time. I can't really keep track of it. That's why everybody's got a folder because everybody has to be specific to them. Um, the last year we worked up for sets of three, and it's not just a squat max at 0.6 meters per second. I want them to write down their fastest speed at that weight. So, like if uh, Lasky got a Six one. I, I don't know if he got a six one. I got it written down somewhere. I think he got a six one at four or five, then maybe a five seven, then maybe a five three. Once we get a point six one in one set, the thing to do is to try to get. I, I told a kid the other day I had him squatting sets of five, and was trying to get these numbers in the point six range. And sometimes if you get a point, he died really quickly. He got a six five. Five three four something four something and a three eight I think is how it went. Um, not exactly sure or one hundred percent sure on those numbers. Uh, but what I do is I have them write down like if we got a six five then a five three. Now, now our next set if we got multiple sets of five now let's try to get two sixes. Play a game with it. They may or may not get that. 
But with the last guy, I know Wiz doing sets of three with that. At 315, I think Wiz doing sets of three, maybe even sets of four. And I just had them write down their top speed at that weight. And, and, I, and someone asked me, how did I come up with the .6? I have no clue. Um, I do have the book, uh, whatever it's called, with Speed. Um, Brian Mann wrote it. I don't know what the name of the book is. Um, I can't think of it right now. Anyway, I've not read that book. I just, the only reason I bought it is to see if I was on the right track. A lot of times I'll buy books and sometimes I'll listen to seminars. Sometimes I pay for a lot of information that I already knew in the first place, but it just verifies that I'm on the right track for what my, my thought process and what I want to do is. Um, 40 yard dash, Wave uh, sets a three. Uh, if he's doing 315 uh, at 305 for, set, for three sets of three, uh, maybe four or five sets of three, Andy, is what I'd get him to. Um, then if he's moving 305 at six meters, I would sets of four. I'd probably do, if he's doing six meters per second, three sets of three, I'd probably do four sets of four and see how many sixes in a row he can get. If he's getting two sixes, I would wave it up 5% to 320. And those should be mid fives. And then if those are mid fives, you can still wave up even more to um, 335. And if he's in the fours for maybe sets of three, I think the 335 for sets of three, the 305 at, at six meters, he can probably do five reps with. Uh, even four sets of five. I'm gonna change it all up because I don't know. I, I, I see the numbers. I know he can get five reps at 305. They all don't have to be in the point six. One could be a, two could be a point six. The next one, the next two can be in a five. The last one can be in a four. And when I talk about the point six, it's just usually the top speed of that set. 305 for sets of five. Then you can wave them to um, 320 for sets of three. Go up 5% and drop two reps. And wave that around based off what the Tendo unit numbers are reading. And if it just don't stick to where I think, um, Ronnie was trying to stick to that one percentage the whole time. So kind of wave that around, play with it. Um, feel free to send me another email. Um, hopefully that helps. So I just don't stay, when they fall out of sixes, don't end the set. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, sixes, fives, okay, sometimes fours. I know sometimes a kid may get a .61 then two fives, a four, and a three. Or sometimes they may only start off with a five, seven. They may not even be a point six. I try to have them struggle and strain. Again, this is kind of where my eyes and where, where I come into play is I like to watch them because it's a lot easier for me to change it when I see it. And then, and sometimes in the kids' folders, I may have them do certain sets and certain reps, but I may change the weight based off their speed per that workout. So we're adjusting and accommodating them at a faster rate than what I'm actually writing for them based off of how their actual performance in the gym is. And y'all heard me talk about, I hate the freaking uh, RPE scale. I hate that crap. I hate that crap. Strong by science or someone else put that out there. And I'm like, damn it. These people are just putting crap out there for, I'm going to say for selling crap. Just because RPE, there's, I hate that. This kid came here and felt like ass. And he said, Jared, I don't feel good. And I don't feel like doing this, but damn, I gave him a weight he's never done for and he made all his reps and he couldn't believe it. That's why I don't like how people feel. Feelings need to be out the door. You need to shut your brain off and you just need to come here and see what your body can do. Get away from your little soft feelings and let's see what happens. And I've had that happen to several kids. Jared, I don't feel like testing. Oh, Jared, I'm not up for this. And they test. Well, they get their fastest 40 yard times and they have their highest vertical jumps. And some days they come in here and they say, Jeremy, I feel like I'm gonna crush it today. You know what that gets crushed is their damn feelings when they leave because they felt great. And sometimes they didn't perform like they thought they were. And sometimes they probably did worse this month than they did last month, but they came in feeling great. So rate of perceived exertion, how you feel about how you're exerting your own force. What if that kid I talked about earlier thought that 0.44 was killing him? Well, is he accelerating the bar like he should? The, if you try to work on accelerating, your reps are not as grueling. Just don't go squat, squat like whoever wrote the bin. Go in the gym for something. Go in to beat a number. We're here for performance. We, we're not here um, 
for just a workout. Now, hey, hey, Jake, can I get a good workout today? I don't know what the hell a good workout is. We don't work out, we train. We're after numbers. We're after breaking personal records. We're after being better than we were last time we were at this gym. So, and if you can get little small chunks of improvement per visit or per time spent here, at the end of the month when you get tested, be a big difference. So anyway, Andy, I hope I answered your question. Um, this, this one comes from uh, Tom Dickerson. Uh, Jared, do you have kids regularly vertical jump without dumbbells or just work vert jump with dumbbells daily and then test the vert without once a month? Uh, well, Tom, I, our leg day, our primarily, our primary leg day is Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. They are supposed to jump every time they come in for leg day. If they're not coming every day, if they come in on a Monday, I'll give them what I call a combo. They're doing upper and lower body. Um, someone told me once before, how many times we bet, we like to bench three days a week. I like to squat three days a week, minimum two. But they're scared to give up some of their accessory work. Jeez, I told you before, my bench will go up just by benching and doing tricep press downs, and I got time to squat after that. So make sure, and I don't know if I've told us before, but bench or a pressing movement, some type of press, whether it be a bench press, overhead press, a press, I don't care what. Most common for sports and weight room activities, most people bench press. So a bench press, a pull up, a deadlift, a squat, those four things will take care of 80% of all athletic movements. Now the other 20% can just be coming from um, other accessory work, but don't go kill yourself on extra work. If you can get better just by benching, if you can get better just by a little bit, by jumping and squatting, go jump and squat. Then bench press and tricep press downs if that's what you care about. Minimum effective dosage, do what, you don't have to go, like I got someone came, and if you've heard me talk about this before, I've had this kid, he was doing 285 sets of three on his squat, and he wanted to continue to push his deadlift. Well, guess what happened to his deadlift? He pushed his deadlift and his squat dropped. Then he couldn't, then next time he came in, he couldn't get 285 for one. You know why these people say they feel so beat up? Oh, I need to recover, I need to recover. Quit doing too much crap. You know, I'm not recovering, no shit. You, you're, don't get, don't work out and let the workout get more out of you than you get out of it. How about that? So, Minimum effective dosage. You take advantage of your workout. Don't let the workout take advantage of you or whatever I said. Well, it was pretty good. Uh, regular revert with dumbbells. I have some kids dumbbell jump only, and I have some kids dumbbell jump with and without the weight the same day. Heavy light method. Heavy weight, heavy underweighted. Um, I'll gladly pay you for any draft of your jump book or your program you could share. I'm training kids and have good strength gains, but not seeing the speed and jump gains. Uh, we've been jumping, but just started testing and measuring bar speed in a squat base on everything. I've tried to take from your podcast. Um, Tom, I appreciate the email. I really appreciate your support. Um, I, my wife's up my ass on this jump book too, because I kept, I've been saying it for probably a little over a year. And I will promise I will get that out. Hopefully, I don't know. I'd like to get it out before summer. I have a hard time writing. I don't know why. I can talk and I can do math. I can't read or write. Um, so I'm just want to, you know, either whatever. So I'll try to get that out. I'd like to get it out for all the kids coming on for summer, for whoever else is out there wants the book. That way you got kind of time. You got a lot more kids coming, hopefully, to your place during the summer. That way you can really see what's going on. Um, so Tom, we jump, the best way to do the dumbbell jumps is jump with and without in the same day, the heavy light method. Um, and I'll explain that in the book, how I came out with that. I was always trying to think of a way, how could I use methods? The, the methods that I use the most to increase explosive power, explosive strength, or the heavy light, uh, and static dynamic. There's load release. We don't really use load release and we don't use pneumatics. And so those are the four main methods that manipulate the nervous system or trick the nervous system into performing better. 
that's why I like the, um, you can get great results if they did depth, if you got depth jumps. They depth, did a depth jump in between their box squats. Squat, depth jump, heavy light. Dumbbell jump. Um, jump with the weight, jump without the weight. You know, and I'll talk about, there's, there's other ways we've done dumbbell jumps. And you got to you got to get rest, and and a lot of these kids in here where these dumbbell jumps, they're not resting long enough. They're going immediately back into it. Rest a minute, rest forty five seconds, rest. Let the next person go. If you got four people or three people per group, four is better because it allows you to rest a little bit longer. Focus in on what you're trying to. When you, I told the kids, when you get on that stupid mat. Demand that number out of your body. This kid couldn't beat his jump the other day, and I forgot what he was jumping with. And Jared, I can't beat it. I can't beat it. I said, yeah, hold on. And so I walked away, and I brought some people around, and I said, watch this. He's going to jump a 21.8. And the kid shook his head. I, I, he's not even gotten out of the 19s. No way. And so I brought the people around, and he saw the people. You can tell the way he was looking in his eyes. He was looking around at the people. You surround yourself with people when you're training. If you're trying to beat the dumbbell jumps by yourself, not going to happen. Turn the music up. Create an atmosphere. Do something for mental stimulation in order for you to get that. So I said, look, you're going to jump a 21.8. What I did was I planted a seed in that kid's head because he was just jumping. He didn't really, I don't know if he put a number in his head to start for to go for whatever that day, but once I put that number in his head, then I brought more people over to watch him. He jumped, he landed, he had 21.8. And they thought I was some type of damn wizard because I called the number before he even jumped. And I did that um, another time the same day, but I forgot the number of what I called. And on the third person, I said he was gonna jump a 30.1 and he actually jumped a 30.3. I was a little off. And he couldn't believe it because he couldn't hardly, he, He's, I got 29, Jared, but now I'm at 28, so I can't get out of 28s. I said, hold on, look, you're going to jump a 30.1 this next jump. And he said, there's no way, I can't do it. I said, you're about to jump a 30.1. I brought more people over. Pressure's on. Boom, jumps, lands, 30.3. I wasn't precise, I wasn't on, but I was close enough. So, anyway, uh, you got to surround yourself. You got to create atmosphere, and you got to push yourself. You just don't go over there. Please, just don't go over there and jump. Um, I don't know if I could put some videos in with this jump thing. I'm really trying to figure. When I do stuff, I want to do a good job. So I procrastinate on this book because I quite honestly do not know how I want it to look. I don't even know what I want to call it. I just want to put out a product out there. So like if, Tom, you want to buy my book? These questions that you're giving me like this really helps because I, now I can answer the questions within the book. For people that have different questions and these things pop up that I've already solved and I don't think about, you know, like once you know something after for so long, you don't really think about it or you forgot that you knew that because you've already passed that thought process so many years ago. And so this helps if people have any more questions about the dumbbell jumps. You know, 20 plus athletes have achieved 40 inch verticals here or more. This one kid last month or whatever went from a 37 to 40 in one month and we box squatted and we dumbbell jumped. And he really didn't do a whole lot more than that. You know, like I said a while ago, it's the minimum effective dosage. So. I'm going to do another podcast tomorrow. This was a little bit longer than I thought. I didn't think I was actually going to be able to talk for 50 minutes just from four or five questions, but whatever. So anyway, thank you all for watching. Thank you for listening. Please continue to send me emails so I can really help label out this jump book so that I can help a lot more people than my local area. You know, I'm worldwide. There's people all over the world that listen to this. So if you want information, I want to put out a good product because I don't like putting out half-assed stuff. When I buy stuff, I, if I buy a book, I want to read something in that book that I did not know before. When I buy something or listen to something and I already knew it, I kind of get pissed because there's so many people out there just trying to do fake stuff and I don't want to do fake stuff. If I'm going to write a jump book, I'm going to write a damn jump book so that 
hopefully you get the same damn results I do. I'm not selfish. I want to help people. So thank you all for watching. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.